Lectures from the Academy. The title of this podcast is Have Another Cup of Pain, and it is the sixth recorded lecture in a series of lectures selected from the many classes taught by Dr. Gregory T. Lawton to the students of the Blue Heron Academy of Healing Arts and Sciences from 1980 to 2022. Dr. Lawton founded the Blue Heron Academy in 1980, and since that year, thousands of students have learned the practice of true traditional healthcare at the academy, and have gone on to establish practices serving the healthcare needs of their patients. Dr. Lawton is a licensed chiropractor, naturopath, and acupuncturist, as well as a certified naturopath. Hi. My name is Chrissy Dawn, and for the next few minutes, we are going to talk about herbal medicine. Diet, inflammation, and pain. In this podcast, we will discuss the use of mullein leaf and flour, sweet basil, and pain as it relates to our diet and the consumption of coffee. Let's begin. Have another cup of pain. Why should we care about using an herbal pain reliever as opposed to Aleve, Advil, or Nuprin? Over-the-counter drugs are cheap, effective, and more convenient than a cup of herbal tea. However, according to a study published in the American Journal of Therapeutics, complications from non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, have been linked to 103,000 hospitalizations and more than 16,000 deaths per year in the United States. The FDA. Normally, the main cheerleader for pharmaceutical companies has stated, "The FDA is strengthening an existing warning in prescription drug labels and over-the-counter drug fact labels to indicate that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can increase the chance of a heart attack or stroke, either of which can lead to death." In this conversation, I would like to take a deeper look at pain as it relates to our daily diet and beverage choices, and ask the question: Are you and your dietary choices the primary cause of your pain? I am guessing that the answer is probably yes. Diet, caffeine, and pain, or stated another way, have another cup of pain. People who are in pain are usually taking pain medication, from over-the-counter medications to opioid drugs. The list of pharmaceutical drugs designed to relieve pain is extensive. If you combine numbers from the American Cancer Society, American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, there are 170 million Americans in pain. This means that over half the U.S. population is on pain medication. This makes sense, since we know from the Journal of American Medical Association that 60 percent of the U.S. population is taking a prescription drug. Add to this number the number of people taking recreational drugs and drinking alcohol, and well, we are the most drugged nation on earth. I routinely treat patients with two main health complaints: one, they cannot move, walk, lift, sit, or engage in physical activities because of a loss of function in their limbs or back; two, they are in pain. Most of these patients are on prescription medications; many of them are on two to six medications at once. Since the 1970s, I have been attempting to educate my patients regarding the relationship of pain to diet. Allow me to express my frustration for a moment. What sense does it make to take a pain medication, perhaps one or more drugs with serious side effects that are possibly addictive, and then consume foods and beverages which increase pain? Does this make any sense to you? Take, for example, coffee and caffeinated beverages. Eighty-three percent of the U.S. population drinks coffee, and when you add in energy drinks and products like Coke and Mountain Dew, well, that is just about everyone. The popularity of caffeinated beverages is based upon caffeine's effects on the central nervous and endocrine systems of the body. Caffeine is a stimulant that increases brain and nerve impulses and responses. 
Unfortunately, caffeine also increases pain responses and signals. This fact seems to surprise people. But is it a surprise that a chemical which increases nerve activity would increase your pain experience and levels? There is conflicting information in books, magazines, and on the internet, but it is well established that caffeine in any form makes pain worse. Washing down Motrin, Nuprin, Aleve, or Advil with a swallow of coffee makes no sense at all. The more caffeine you consume, the more pain you will have, and the more pain medication you will need. It is a vicious cycle. The next question is how much sugar do you put in each cup of coffee that you drink, or how much sugar is in a bottle of Mountain Dew? The average person consumes three to four cups of coffee per day, and some consume eight or more cups per day. The average coffee drinker adds one to two teaspoons of sugar to each cup of coffee. All sugar, but especially processed sugar, increases overall body inflammation, and inflammation equals pain and degeneration of joints. I write about this issue in more detail in my free health booklet on aging, disease, and inflammation, so consider reading that booklet. There are 62 grams of sugar in one 16-ounce bottle of Mountain Dew, and this is equal to over 12 teaspoons of sugar. When would you ever sit down and just eat 12 teaspoons of sugar, one after the other? If you are in pain to the point that you need pain or anti-inflammatory medications, then you need to understand that the processed sugary foods that you eat and the caffeinated beverages that you drink reduce the effects of your medications and increase your pain. Simply stated, pain, caffeine, and sugar do not go well together. Here is the dietary equation to remember. Sugar fuels inflammation and inflammation causes pain. Caffeine amplifies pain by stimulating pain nerves and pain centers in the brain. The next time you are at Starbucks, go ahead, order another cup of pain. Mullen leaf and a breath of fresh air. Ever since I was a child, and especially when I lived on a farm, I can remember seeing the elegant stalks of mullen along the roadside and in fields. I have always admired mullen's long stalks dotted with yellow flowers and thought of them as quite beautiful. Mullen is a very versatile herbal medicine that has been used for centuries to bring relief from breathing problems associated with asthma, colds, influenza, COVID, and other respiratory illnesses such as COPD. Mullen helps to soften mucus in the respiratory passages, aiding the respiratory system in the process of removing mucus and improving breathing. But that is not all that Mullen does. It also relieves irritation and inflammation resulting from infection and infectious illnesses, thereby reducing pain. I recommend Molin frequently to my patients for health problems like generalized pain, inflammation, and soreness, as well as bronchial and lung congestion and conditions. Its anti-inflammatory properties reduce inflammation, and its anodyne properties relieves pain. Molin, or Verbiscum thapsus, makes a pleasant-tasting tea to which honey or raw sugar may be added in small amounts. When used for pain, soreness, or inflammation, I suggest three cups of mullein tea per day, spread out during the day. Mullein's beneficial properties include mucilage, gum, a trace of volatile oil, resin, saponins, the flavonoids hesperidin and verbascoside, bitter glycosides, and tannins. Mullen is a valuable remedy for most conditions affecting the respiratory system. As mullen has a balancing effect on the lungs, mullen tea relieves lung congestion and swollen lymph nodes. It reduces inflammation of the mucous membranes, making it an excellent remedy for dry chronic coughs, such as coughs from bronchitis and asthma. 
When I am teaching herbal medicine at the academy, a question that I ask my students is, why would you think or believe that herbal medicines that are provided by God through nature would be less effective than the man-made synthetic drugs manufactured from petroleum or crude oil by drug companies? It is foolish to think so. Find your medicine in nature, not at the drugstore, and you will be better for it. The next lecture from the Academy is entitled, Sweet Basil to the Rescue. When I think of sweet basil, I think of spaghetti sauce. However, sweet basil has far more uses than making sauces for Italian food. Sweet basil, or as it is known by its scientific name, Osimum basilicum, has many other qualities and benefits. It has been used as a medicine by numerous cultures for thousands of years, and there are records of its use going back for 5,000 years. Basil is a good source of vitamin K, beta-carotene, and iron. The plant is known to possess antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant properties. Many of the benefits of basil can be attributed to its volatile oils and flavonoids, as well as powerful antioxidants that reduce inflammation, are anti-aging, and promote a healthy cardiovascular system. The essential oils in sweet basil have been found in research studies to have potent antibacterial qualities. These chemical constituents of sweet basil have been shown in studies to be effective in restricting the growth of Listeria monocytogenes, Staphylococcus aureus, and Escherichia coli, and several other pathogenic bacteria. Several years ago, as I was getting ready to go to my office, there was a knock on my apartment door. When I opened the door, I found my patient Alice bent over with severe abdominal pain and bloating. The situation would have been funny if Alice wasn't in so much pain from gastrointestinal distress. I invited Alice in and questioned her about her painful situation. It turned out that the cause of her pain was a serious bout of flatulence, also known as gas, from a pizza party the night before. Alice had spent a restless, sleepless night in pain from abdominal bloating and stomach irritation. I helped Alice to my couch and went into the kitchen, where I put on a glass pot of water and heated it up just below boiling. To the water I added some sweet basil leaves. I allowed the mixture to simmer and then turned it down to allow the leaves to steep. After the infusion sat for a few minutes, I poured a portion into a ceramic cup added a small amount of honey, and gave it to my unexpected morning visitor. Within 20 minutes, she was pain-free, gas-free, and on her way to work. Where the gas went, I do not want to know. This is one of the amazing benefits of sweet basil leaf tea. Sweet basil will work in most any form for stomach irritation and flatulence. In some cultures, the raw leaves are eaten with or before a meal. I have had patients who I have educated on its use, and who are in gastrointestinal distress, rush into a grocery store and buy the dried leaf and chew it in their mouth and swallow the juice. This method works almost as well as an infusion of the tea. You can also put powdered sweet basil into capsules and take them as needed. Sweet basil is a pleasant-tasting tea that can be consumed at any time and is not known to have any adverse effects. The next time you have stomach distress, let sweet basil come to the rescue. This has been Lectures from the Academy. I hope it hasn't been too much of a pain listening to me today. I sure had a gas reading for you. Until next time, stay healthy.